thanks everybody for coming. And I think what it means is that there is more enthusiasm for Kate Millett now in 2009 than I thought there might be. So that's absolutely terrific. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying why, why I'm doing this lecture, why I chose Kate Millett, why I offered her for this lecture. Uh, sexual politics is really important to me because it's the book that made me a feminist. There was already a feminist movement going on in America before 1970 when the book was first published. Not much in Britain, where I was at that time, but it was reading that book that made me a feminist and if you talk to other women from that time, it made thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of women feminists at that time. So it's a very, very important book. It's not just a book of theory, it's a book that actually created and helped to create a movement. Now, I was a student um, at the height of what was seen as, or has been called, the sexual revolution of the late 1960s. I tried hard to be liberal at that time and live up to the new values about sex that were around at that time. I did my very best. <laughs> now, then I read sexual politics. I was teaching in a girls' boarding school in 1971. I wasn't a trained teacher. I just, you know, you could in those days just go and teach. And as soon as it was published in the UK, um, it I, I took it into the discussion group that the headmistress asked me to set up. It was a sixth form discussion group in the lounge with chintz armchairs, and I was running a discussion group there every week. And I read Sexual Politics, and I went straight in the next day, and I said, girls, this is the book that we have to talk about. So it was pretty exciting for me, and I think pretty exciting for them. I was sort of communicating it directly. Uh, when I reread the book today, what strikes me is that it has not aged or become in any way really out of date. Um, there are some books that you read from that period, like Shulamith Firestone's The Dialectic of Sex, which, a lot of which is out of date. It really doesn't fit now. But that's not the case with sexual politics. The ideas not only seem fresh, but crystal clear, compared with the great muddying of feminist messages that has come out of the academy in the 40 years since it was published. I realize that the basis of my feminist thinking is in the book, and it's expressed with a confidence that today would be called anti-sex, incorrect, totalizing, essentializing, ahistorical, and the host of other terms that are used to traduce radical feminists today. The reason... Uh, I offered to speak about this book is not just because of its political importance, but also because I consider it quite unreasonable that Kate Millett's work is generally excluded from the canon of significant social theorists. She's unlikely to feature in collections or on university courses. I consulted a website on social theory which listed 32 thinkers, of whom only one was a woman, and that was Harriet Martineau, 19th century economist. Uh, I looked at who was included in some recent significant readers on social theory, um, readings in social theory, the classic tradition to postmodernism, contained 37 pieces, only two by women, the sociologist Dorothy Smith um, and the uh, theorist Michelle Barrett from the UK. But there were no, no radical feminists at all, certainly not Kate Millett, though she's arguably a lot more famous than the women who are included. And then there was Social Theory, a History, edited by Alex Kalinikos, which has no women mentioned in the contents, only men. Then there was Social Theory, the Multicultural and Classic Readings in 1998. Quite a few women, about a dozen out of the many dozens of male thinkers, but none are radical feminists. There's no Andrea Dworkin, no Mary Daly, no Catherine McKinnon, no Kate Millett despite the very, very considerable importance of these thinkers and their ideas, they are quite completely excluded. Now, I realize that the key thinkers offered in this series are rather idiosyncratic, and they reflect the thinking of those who have offered them rather than this series itself. But I think the question of how thinkers enter the canon and make it into the ranks of social theorists or political philosophers of significance is a very important one. 
we need to understand how Kate Millett, as well as other radical feminist theorists, get left out. And it isn't an accident, I think, but there are the workings of power in the exclusion of these women from the ranks of social theorists. I want to talk about the, the importance of the book at the time that it was published. Sexual politics was out of print during the 1990s, which shows that the, its lack of importance, you could say, during that period, although it is possible to acquire it now. And indeed, I think there are some copies. Yet in 1970, the book created an extraordinary shock to the political system of male domination, a shock that's been largely forgotten, I think, today. Uh, radical feminist theorist Andrea Dworkin wrote of the book, the world was sleeping and Kate Millett woke it up. Betty Friedan had written about the problem that had no name. That's the woman who, in 1963, wrote the, the liberal feminist book, The Feminist, Feminine Mystique. Uh, Mystique. Kate Millett named it, illustrated it, exposed it, analyzed it. And Dworkin says, I cannot think of anyone who accomplished what Kate Millett did with this one book. It remains the alpha and omega of the women's movement. Everything that feminists have done is foreshadowed, predicted, or encouraged by sexual politics. And I have to say, I agree with that. Now, the most significant thing that Millett did in this book was to politicize sex. The male sexual liberals of the 1960s, who she looks at in this book, and that I grew up with, proclaimed that the problem with sex was simply that sexual freedom had been repressed. There was no criticism of the way in which sexuality was constructed. The alternative press of the late 60s in London, such as Oz, International Times, presented innumerable photos of naked women and promoted pornography as vital to sexual and somehow also political freedom. The male novelists whose work was being rescued from censorship in the period, such as D.H. Lawrence, or published for the first time, like Miller and Genet, were seen as warriors for sexual freedom against the fuddy-duddy forces of prudery and conservatism. Sex was not seen as political, only the repression of it. Sex itself was seen as natural, biological, and wholly good. Now, Millet delivered a scathing feminist critique of this self-serving masculine folly, she showed that the subordination of women is powerfully constructed through and in acts of penile penetration of women. And she pointed out that sex is not natural, but politically formed out of and in support of male domination. In the book, she examines the way that sexual intercourse in various forms is written about by the self-proclaimed sexual revolutionary novelists of the 60s to demonstrate the power politics that they express. And she explains what she's going to be looking at here. She says, Coitus can scarcely be said to take place in a vacuum, although of itself it appears a biological and physical activity. It is set so deeply within the larger context of human affairs that it serves as a charged microcosm of the variety of attitudes and values to which culture subscribes. Among other things, it may serve as a model of sexual politics on an individual or personal plane. And this understanding of the political construction of sexuality inspired my work on the history and politics of sexuality. In relation to the title of the book, Sexual Politics, she explains, many would find it hard to see the relationship between the sexes in a political light at all. I don't know whether that is true now, but I suspect there are still many who would fail to see that it is political. But she, however, defines the term politics as referring to power-structured relationships, arrangements whereby one group of persons is controlled by another, and patriarchy she identifies as one of these. And she states that the situation between the sexes is one of dominance and subordination, which has created a most ingenious form of interior colonization, that is, inside the head, meaning that women often cannot see they are oppressed, because they are fully acculturated to that oppression and may even in defend the interests of the men who are their masters. Sexual dominion, she argues, is perhaps the most pervasive ideology of our culture and provides its most fundamental concept of power. Now, I'll say something about the background of Kate Millett and where she was coming from and what she did in her life before I go back to the book in more detail. She came from an Irish-American family. Her mother was a dramatist. The family was strongly political and aligned with the left. In the 1960s, she was involved in anti-war and civil rights politics in the US, 
And many feminists who created second wave feminism in the US were involved in civil rights politics. That was a real crucible of the construction of feminism. In the mid-1960s, she joined the, uh, the newly reborn women's movement. And she joined the National Organization for Women. So she had a few years' experience of feminism before this book came out. She was sort of working out her ideas. She was 36 when it was published. It was her PhD, so she was writing this PhD, which was in literary theory, in her early 30s. She was an artist, and she was married at the time to a Japanese sculptor. Her life at this time is documented in her third book, which is called Flying, in 1974, where she writes about the political turmoil of that time, about um, coming out as a lesbian, her relationship with her husband, uh, what the politics were meaning, and it's a, it's a very, very exciting book, I have to say. Now, she was a lesbian before her marriage. She became one again during the heady feminism of those times, in which lesbianism was understood to be a way of uniting the personal and the political and was seen as progressive and feminism in action. And in the late 80s, she explained that her husband constituted her only loving relationship with a man. She published a memoir about a lesbian relationship she had after her marriage in 1977, Sita, in which she details her emotional suffering in that unequally balanced affair. And both Flying and Sita were compulsory reading for feminists like myself in the 1970s, who were also choosing a lesbian life in consonance with our politics. And I chose to be a le lesbian in 1977 under the same sort of influences that had affected um, Kate Millett. Now, when Kate Millett came out publicly about what she called her bisexuality, immediately after the publication of Sexual Politics, it caused a huge stir in the media. Feminists, of course, came out marching in her support. And what happened was that heterosexual feminists wore badges saying that they were lesbians on the grounds that they mustn't let the lesbians in the movement be picked off and isolated. So it was a very strong sort of solidaristic move on the part of heterosexual feminists at that time. All feminists, it was reason, should be prepared to, be, to say that they are lesbians, to be assumed to be lesbians. In fact, in the 70s, um, a badge that most of us were wearing, it seems to me, was, how dare you presume I'm heterosexual? And that was also on posters in everybody's kitchens. It was everywhere. Now, her only other book, apart from those three, that's specifically um, concerned with feminist issues was called The Prostitution Papers, and that was published in 1973. And I used Millet's insights from that book about prostitution on the first page of my new book, The Industrial Vagina. So important was her framing of the issue of prostitution at that time. She wrote that prostitution was paradigmatic, somehow the very core of the female's condition, and reduced women to cunt. Feminists in the 1960s and 70s understood prostitution to be a hangover from traditional male-dominant societies, and they understood that it would disappear with the advance of women's equality. It was, as Millet put it, a living fossil, an old form of slave relations still existing in the present. And her book is a swinging feminist critique of the harmful practice of prostitution, consisting of interviews, two of them with women who were in prostitution. Now, in the meantime, since the publication of that book, which reflected the universal, pretty much, ideas of feminists at that time, the understanding of pro this understanding of prostitution has been lost. Neoliberal economic forces have made the sex industry a very profitable market sector. And in some places, a few places, such as Victoria, brothel prostitution has been legalized, and the violence of prostitution is now administered by consumer affairs. At this time, the extraordinary situation exists that the majority of feminists in Australia are likely to think that prostitution is legitimate work and expresses women's agency and choice. This is not true in other countries of the world. It is only really in legalized regimes where most feminists are likely to take that position and they are affected as a result of the legalization and the normalization of prostitution in holding those beliefs. Now, after this period... In the 70s, Millet's books were not specifically feminist or lesbian. She wrote many more. She wrote a book called The Politics of Cruelty on the History of Torture, 
She wrote a book called The Looney Bin Trip in the 1980s about her battles with what was called at the time manic depression, now more often called bipolar disorder. And in that book, she explains that she was compulsorily detained in a mental hospital after ceasing to take the lithium that she was prescribed. She established an artist colony for women in New York State, which she continues to run. And she set up a Christmas tree farm to provide herself with income. And as far as I know, she is still doing Christmas trees. Now, despite the importance and the effect of sexual politics, she does not consider it to be her most important book. In fact, when she is interviewed, she sometimes refers to it as her thesis. That was my thesis. And she thinks others of her books are more important that probably none of us here have heard of, or many of us. Now, the reception of the book, it was immediately a popular success. It sold 80,000 copies within months, which is not usually the case for works of theory. Time magazine featured it and her on the cover, and it actually um, says that uh, she was the Mao Zedong of feminism at this time. However, she doesn't get the sort of mileage Mao Zedong does. His books are probably still in print. Now, uh, male readers were often discomforted by this book, and it caused one of her thesis advisors, someone called George Stade, George Stade at Columbia University, to remark, reading the book is like sitting with your testicles in a nutcracker. <laughs> I think thesis advisors should not be allowed to have such biases, it has to be said. Um, now, when Sexual Politics was published, Women's Liberation was still new. Uh, much has changed between then and now, but in one area, which is the main area she addresses in her book, the politics of sexuality, the subordinate status of women is clearly demonstrated and powerfully maintained today. Indeed, the values of the sex industry now dominate advertising in public space, the fashion industry, even for little baby girls in porn star T-shirts, the entertainment industry, and create huge problems for the self-esteem of girls and young women. And the sex industry now constitutes a huge obstacle in the path of women's emancipation, which I suspect that jo um, Kate Millett could not have envisaged or imagined back in the 1970s, and neither could I. Now, what she does in the book is that she, um, she does scholarly analyses of the masculine biases of anthropology, sociology, economics, history, and so on and so on. And she shows great familiarity with those literatures, but the meaning of sexual politics she considers to be most clearly displayed in the sex novels of the 1960s. And she says, I've operated on the premise that there's room for a criticism which takes into account the larger cultural context in which literature is conceived and produced. And I think this is probably not a very fashionable view now, either when literary critics tend to stress that every reader can have a different interpretation and the author is dead, and you're not supposed to look for a truth about sexual power relations in literature. I think that would be viewed with suspicion these days. Now, she analysed novels by D.H. Lawrence, Henry Miller, Norman Mailer, and Jean Genet, who she described as cultural agents who shaped attitudes and as counter-revolutionary sexual politicians. She was very brave to do this, since these men had hero status in the 1960s, particularly on the left. Uh, women were not supposed to be taking them apart. She included um, Genet because the Thief's Journal, because she wanted to show that the sexual power dynamics in a novel by a gay man were actually very similar to those in the heterosexual novels by the heterosexual writers. Um, these novelists used a lot of language uh, using words like fuck and cunt all the time. And one insight that she gives helps to explain why dirty language and pornography um, have become so acceptable to all social strata of men in the last half of the century. What she suggested was that crudeness about sex was once seen as evidence of lower class status. It was picked up by upper class men, she reckons, after the Second World War because it was seen as creating masculinity and it made them more masculine if they were going around saying the F word and the C word and writing explicitly about the sexual degradation of women. That bolstered their masculinity even though they'd been middle class and once might have had to take uh, account of chivalry or slightly different sorts of attitudes towards women. You know when um, men were supposed to not in front of the women and the women went off and they went off and smoked somewhere else and then they could say F and C or whatever it is they wanted to say on their own. Uh, but she considers that that changed in, in, in that period. Now the writers she, uh, she criticises introduced scatological language then into respectable literature saying the F word in the 1960s was regarded as a sign of liberation and progressiveness, as well as a transgressive act against the conservative values that the avant-garde was rescuing the new generation from at that time. 
And the desire of left-wing men to use the F word is best represented by the use of the word by the theatre critic Kenneth Tynan. I remember this very well. Um, he was the author of O Calcutta. In 1965, in a live TV debate on the BBC, he commented, he used the word, first time on British television, he said, I doubt if there are any rational people to whom the word fuck would be particularly diabolical, revolting, or totally forbidden. Um, now, he was a darling of the left, uh, uh, the left intelligentsia, and a self-styled sexual revolutionary who campaigned against censorship and liked sadistic sex. His second wife, Elaine Dundee, wrote of him, to cane a woman on her bare buttocks to hurt and humiliate her was what gave him his greatest sexual satisfaction. During the second marriage, he engaged in an extramarital affair in order to do sadistic sex and engaged prostituted women in threesomes with his wife in order to do that. So this was very sexual revolutionary behavior in that period. Uh, the F word is exciting to men, I suggest, because it's freighted with meanings of male power and the degradation of women. It is not a descriptive word in the way that these men used it as, as a word simply to describe sexual activity. Um, it, the, the cruel excitement that men experience through saying the word and have traditionally experienced through saying the word is because of what it means. The, the, the F word connotes, connotes an act in which men dominate, conquer, and enter women. That's the excitement of it. Uh, the C word, too, as used by such men, is not neutral, but a word that encompasses their contempt for women and women's genitals. The use of these words in the novel's millet, millet analyses makes it clear that they bear hostile masculine ideas about sex and women and could not be easily taken up as women's language. I have never been one of those feminists who said that we should take up the F word and the C word, and they've simply been, you know, badly used by men, but we can rescue them. I have no intention of rescuing those terms. Now, the writers whose uh, work Millet analyzes were the stars of the so-called so sexual revolution. Andrea Dworkin says, when Millet wrote sexual politics, Miller, Mailer, and Lawrence were the sages of sexual revolution, and they were the writers of subversion. Uh, Dworkin says, they socialized a whole generation into believing that force and violence were valued elements of sex. And anyone who found their work harmful at that time would be accused of being anti-sex and prudish. Their novels represent the underlying ideology of the sexual revolution, the misogynist construction of men's sexual freedom and delight out of women's degradation. They saw themselves as knights jousting with the evil forces of prudery and censorship to liberate and tell the truth about sex. And Mailer, Norman Mailer himself, describes the battles of the publishers who were bringing out these novels and their legal representatives in the 50s and early 60s as being like the American Civil War. The sexual revolutionary authors won the war. He says, a war has been won. Writers like myself can now in America write about any subject. It is sexual and we are explicit no matter. The American writer now has his freedom. Charles Rembar, lawyer for the publishers, um, laid out the free speech argument. He said, in the free interchange of ideas, the truth will emerge. Well, of course, it, it so happens that obviously feminists do not have the truth about pornography because their truth has not emerged. I mean, these sort of statements show no understanding whatsoever of the power structures that construct what can be said and what can be heard. Um, Millet begins with Henry Miller's Sexus. Um, begins the book with a quote from Henry Miller's Sexus. The book was published by Grove Press in New York in 1965. I was 17 years old in that year, and I was determined to become a sexual revolutionary. And Henry Miller's novels were some of the books that I tried hard to like at that time. The Grove Press website informs us that Grove's books have broken down sexual, cultural, and political barriers. Uh, Grove produced all of the books that Millet is uh, criticizing. Also, William Burroughs, who mistakenly shot his wife dead whilst playing a William Tell game, Kerouac, and others. Um, they had fun, these chaps. Now... Uh, most famously, Grove Press published D.H. Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover in its first unexpurgated commercial edition. Um, and I'll just say a little about that book because Millet goes into um, D.H. Lawrence's work in detail. Um, she, Millet argues that D.H. Lawrence was responding to the women's emancipation movement of the early 20th century in his writing. And she sees him as putting women back in their place and their, that place turns out to be awed phallus worship. Now, in the trial that allowed this book to be published, because there was a censorship trial, it was judged to have literary merit, and the defense of literary merit was then used to defend many other woman-hating books in the next decade. So I'll just give you a couple of quotations. 
um, from the book, um, I do realize that it's actually one of the problems of feminists and scholars who actually want to look at books like these and to look at pornography is uh, that it's quite difficult. It's like watching, you know, um, troops killing people and weapons of war because, not because it's about sex, but because the values are so woman-hating that it's very, very difficult to read. So I hope you will not mind my reading a few extracts this evening and will bear in mind that I am aware of the effect, and the effect is not because these descriptions are about sex, because of, but because of the values that they are freighted with. And for women particularly, it's hard to hear this stuff. Um, and this is Lady Chatterley when she first sees the gamekeeper's phallus in Lady Chatterley's Lover. Quite a famous quotation. How strange, she said slowly, how strange he stands there, so big and so dark and cocksure. Is he like that? So proud, she murmured, uneasy. And so lordly, now I know why men are so overbearing. But he's lovely, really. Like another being, a bit terrifying, but lovely, really. And he comes to me. And then the gamekeeper replies with instructions to his penis on what the penis is after, which is cunt. Right? There, um, and there's a lot more about cunt in the book. And Lady Chatterley is seen in this uh, quotation simply as cunt. Best bit of cunt left on earth, and cunt a... Eh? That the beauty of Lee Lass. Ball, uh, balls, on the other hand, are described very differently. Um, he says, balls are the roots, roots of all that's lovely, the primeval root of all full beauty. Moreover, he says, the root of all sanity is in the balls. So that's <laughs> a pretty clear sexual politics going on in Lady Chatterley's Lover. Now, Lady Chatterley needed to be rehabilitated by the penis because her life was distorted by education and being a modern woman. And anal penetration is particularly efficacious. In all of these novels, it's particularly efficacious for teaching women lessons. Huh? Um, and uh, she, uh, it says in the novel that about the anal penetration, she had needed this phallic hunting out. She had secretly wanted it, and she had believed that she would never get it. 